Greeting, stranger. Apologies again for the delay, but I am now ready to get underway once more. We are getting close to the lands of Dark Moon Vale, but there is time, I think, for a couple more tales before we reach Andoran's northernmost region and the slopes of the Five Kings Mountains. For the moment, I would like to introduce you to the Verduran Forest that lies to the east, nestled between the Carpenden Plains and the Talden border. Well, Truthfully, it is somewhat restrictive to speak about Aviston's largest woodland within the confines of a tour of a single nation, for the forest is largely within Taldor's borders, only about one-third being under Andoran influence. On the other hand, even that third contains more than enough wonder and history to fill one of my travel tomes thrice over, so perhaps it is best that I can leverage an excuse to discuss only the forest's western expanse. Mm -hmm. And I think a storm is approaching us. Let's begin before it arrives, and we can retreat back below deck to weather the worst of it. Now, where to begin? When in doubt, consult a map. Here is an overview of the Verduran Forest's geography. As you can see, to call it large seems to be an understatement. This strikes one as especially true as one begins to compare it with the other forests of Aviston. Nothing even comes close. The Shadowwood in the north, or the Whisper or Barrow Woods in the south, are maybe each half the size of the Verduran Forest, but none can individually compare. It averages around 400 miles wide and stretches for almost as long. Politically, at least insofar as the humanoid nations of Galarian are concerned, the Verduran Forest can be split into three areas the eastern and central thirds, overseen by Taldor a northern protrusion in ever-chaotic Galt, and the western third, defined by the river Selen, overseen by Andoran. However, once you cross the threshold into the shade of the forest's canopy, you would be wise to consider yourself abroad from these lands, because their capitals, militaries and interests will very quickly seem so very far away. This is particularly true in Andoran's portion of the forest, because within here dwell the wildest and, many claim, most wrathful fae. You see, Taldor signed its Treaty of the Wildwood with the most powerful druidic faction in the Verduran in 3841. This pact more or less established peace between the two factions, and successfully ended the constant fae attacks on Taldon settlers who dared live too close to the forest's edge. And Doran has not attempted anything of the sort, partially because its economy is much more reliant on lumber than Taldor's. The only reason Andoran has not yet seen a prominent fey retaliation is perhaps that the Lumber Consortium, for all of its failings, does at least have the sense to focus its operations on the Arthfell and other smaller woodlands within their reach, instead of the Verduran. Consequently, the forest has been affected comparatively little by outsiders. Smaller companies of independent lumberjacks do fell trees here and there, but these are like the bites of small flies to most inhabitants. That said, not every lumberjack returns from the forest, and it is not unheard of for some operations to fall silent overnight. I think perhaps the consortium has calculated that it is better to buy the fruits of others' labour when the labour is so perilous. The overall population of Andoran's portion of the Verduran forest is tiny, perhaps 10 to 15,000 depending on how you count. Even the sparse expanse of the Darkmoon Vale is more densely populated, by humans at any rate. The wilderness remains almost totally untamed, with the exception of a single large town situated deep in the north of the forest, close to the Andoran Galton border. It is called Belis and it occupies a bluff that overlooks the River Selen, without whose presence the town would quickly wither and die. Belis is a strange place. The buildings are ever giving way to blooms of orange daisies, and the surrounding woodland is chiefly pine, whose trunks grow thick and tall but remain spaced far enough apart to permit a limited amount of expansion. The citizens of Belis, numbering around 5,000, are greatly concerned with beekeeping, and apiaries dot the area as readily as fields dot the Carpenton Plains. Belis honey and wax are renowned throughout the inner sea. Some call Belis the capital of the region, and that is only true insofar as there are no competitors for the title. 
This far east in Andoran, you either live in Belis or in some tiny village. There is no middle ground. The only convenient way to approach the town, assuming you are not a druid in the good graces of the local fey, is by river. As with many things in the forest, convenient here is a relative term. The river Selen is contested between Taldor and Andoran, each claims it entirely for their own. It empties into the inner sea at Star Bay, which is more or less under Talden control, and so the mouth of the Selen is patrolled by an underfunded branch of Taldor's military called the River Guard. Once you enter the forest proper, however, your biggest threats will be pirates, slavers, and privateers, most of whom, in the latter group, can be traced back to the Andoran government in some way. This continues the trend of Andoran factions outsourcing all work involving the Verduran forest to other people. Nevertheless, if you successfully navigate all these threats, cling to the western edge of the Selen, and travel upriver all the way to Belis, you will encounter your first curiosity there the pit. This is a rather ramshackle series of tents, booths, and other temporary to semi-permanent structures erected not by the townsfolk, but by the various merchants, traders, and intermediaries wishing to accost the Belizeans. It is called the pit because it lies directly on the riverbank, whereas Belis itself remains resolutely on its bluff, looking down from on high. Many individuals come to the pit to set up a staging ground for independent logging contractors. They typically stay from mid-spring until the early winter, keeping Bellis's effective population quite high. These contractors are called pit jacks, and they are paid handsomely by the lumber consortium for their efforts. Indeed, should they sell to another party, they may well find themselves blacklisted from future employment opportunities. If you meander up the bluff, you will approach Belis proper from the west, and come across the best protected buildings, surrounded on three sides by a stone wall, which belong to the town administration and the citizen's watch. The watch enforces an after-dark curfew, a harsh but necessary measure for a settlement deep in the forest with selfish interests at heart. The fey folk and druids can be subtle in their cruelty. It is not uncommon for individuals to be replaced by doppelgangers and other lookalikes. However, the watch does not extend to the pit, so almost all nightlife is relegated to the riverbank. The sole exception is the Palace, a very rough-and-tumble establishment run by the ever-grinning Brillum Marsh that caters exclusively to pit jacks. Technically, the Watch's curfew only prevents people from being on the street, so as long as all Marsh's patrons are happy to drink all night long, he is happy to continue serving them. He even produces a caustic brew he calls Jackfire, a strong spirit distilled from honey and certain toxic roots local to the area. I can attest personally to its potency. Marsh is something of a town pariah, and I think that the palace is destined for arson, either accidentally through overzealous carousing, or deliberately via disgruntled townsfolk. I doubt Mr. Marsh will care either way, though. During the daytime, the peace is kept by a constable and their deputy. Druids, fey, and forest creatures seldom cross their minds, though, for most of Bellis's problems can in practice be traced straight to a lumberjack. Nevertheless, Constable House does have a pair of miserable cells for anyone who needs to sober up or be shipped back downriver to face a proper trial. When I was last in Bellis, the constable was an elderly fellow called Adram Colrain, but uh, that must have been at least a decade ago. It would surprise me if he was still in charge, though I suspect his deputy, Bonnie Grant, has taken up that particular mantle of responsibility. Good luck to her. If you want to visit Belis as a tourist, there are only two points of interest I would endorse. The first is the humble Belis Library, one of its oldest buildings, although that is not saying much, for the town was founded only 60 years ago. Still, the founders were keen not to allow their children to grow up uneducated, and so they pulled their written texts into a single repository, to be made freely available for all residents. The collection of documents there is small, but broad, I discovered poetry collections, agricultural manuals, and even Galton treatises on uh, good governance of a nation. 
I am not sure how well received that latter volume would be today. The second site is somehow even more humble. Walk southeastwards just outside of town to a small outcropping of trees. Hiding shaded in their midst stands a chapel to the goddess Shailene, the Eternal Maiden. Shailene concerns herself with beauty, love, art, music, and all things beloved in civilized societies, and it does not surprise me that her worship has found its way even into the depths of the Verduran forest. Belis is hardly the only settlement in the forest, though it is the only one that sees frequent trade. Two other settlements might attract a wanderer's attention. The first is the fishing village of Kaldeman, with a population scarcely over 500. Located on the northwestern edge of the forest, along the river Dragonfly that flows down from the Five Kings Mountains, Kaldeman has recently become famous not for its buildings or people, but for its wildlife. It seems a pair of creatures, one a red reaver and the other a grey render, have overlapping territorial claims in the Kaldeman hinterlands. Not much is known about these beasts, but physically they are as large as horses and twice as strong. There have been reports of entire trees being uprooted and hurled at foes in the past. That said, each species is generally peaceful if left alone, but they make an exception for one another. Should a red reaver and a grey render meet, they both immediately fight relentlessly, as though vessels for some bloodthirsty power. Oddly, these brawls rarely end in death. In fact, it is not at all obvious what they accomplish, for neither abandons its territory, regardless of the fight's outcome. For the citizens of Kaldeman, though, this regular spectacle has put it on the map as a tourist attraction. Many claim that it is tantamount to an ethical blood sport. Make of that what you will. The final settlement is Fusil, which can be found about 175 miles directly south of Belis. This bizarre hamlet's populace has sworn off outside influence, trading almost exclusively with forest locals for their requirements. They seem uniquely untroubled by attacks from Fae or harassment from druid circles, and official investigations into why this is have all met with… failure. My unofficial investigation, though, met with some success. It is clear to me that the Fusil Folk's decision to live in harmony with nature is one half of a bargain made by its founders, presumably with local Fae guardians. In exchange, the villagers are shielded from malady and malevolence, but not guests, apparently, as I discovered almost too late. I urge you to avoid Fusil, unless you are uniquely enthusiastic about quartz, which the settlement quarries in abundance. Now, the Verduran Forest, at least the part of it captured by Andoran, contains one final curiosity. But it is hardly a settlement, at least not an agricultural or mineral one. It is a monastery, ruined long ago in the calamity that has since warped into little more than a local legend. Located in the southwest, about halfway between Akarin and Steyr, lies Black Forks. The architecture is eerie, to say the least, and the only plants that dare grow near the site are the mounds of moss that cover the oily black stone used in its construction. The ruins contain no windows or ventilation, but thousands of tiny holes have been drilled through the outer walls to allow tiny shafts of light to penetrate the interior corridors, which themselves all lead to a calm, black pool. The liquid seems to be water, but so far no explanation has satisfied why its colour is so dark. Surrounding the pool are stone tablets depicting the rituals of the monks who used to live there, replete with masochism. Most infamously, initiates would be suspended over the pool for two days with no food and no rest, a double-ended black fork secured against their chests and throat to deny either. Some died attempting it, but even those who lived were forever changed by the experience, their minds touched by something said to dwell in the pool's depths. Thus, it was said that not every initiate died, yet none survived. Then, about a thousand years ago, a large band of goblinoids swept southwards from the Verduran forest. A lot of blood was spilled on the ground around the monastery, and the entity awoke. 
It slaughtered many of the surviving monks and then departed into Andoran, laying waste to everything it encountered. A terrible battle was fought against the entity somewhere in the Carpenden Plains, and although every participating soldier was killed or mortally wounded, they succeeded in driving it back into the pool. Since then, its waters have remained still and undisturbed. The incident was forgotten, well, almost forgotten, and is remembered now only as a warning to locals. Avoid black forks in daylight and darkness alike, for it is always black in the pool. Well, stranger, that is an overview of Andoran's region of the Verduran forest. There are other rumours you can uncover, I am sure, like the Bee Man of Belis, or the roaming band of Andorans convinced that the only good government is a non-existent government. But to learn about those, you will need to visit the places I have described. My tour takes us instead northwards into the mountains, but do not think for a moment that there isn't more to learn around every corner and down every alleyway. Such is the joy of adventuring. Ah, it seems I was right about that storm after all. Come on, let's venture below. I will see what other lore tidbits I have lying around in my cabin. You freshen up and meet me in fifteen minutes or so. Well, until then.